Hello! In the past, I have talked about the many distractions which get in the way of making some of my more informative videos. Well, we have just such an example here. But what a distraction! It is, of course, the venerable PM5534. Now, I know what you're thinking. Oh, not another one. Not another Philips pattern generator. Now, bear with me here. This wing is going to be quite a lot more interesting than what we have seen before, because unlike the previous models we've looked at, this one is mostly analog, and I think it's going to be quite a bit more interesting to look at. And I think we'll also be able to learn quite a lot more about test cards in the process. Before we talk about the what, let's quickly talk about the when and the who. The PM5534 is somewhat of a sleeper product. I wasn't able to find many mentions of it in historic magazines and what have you. In terms of the when, it is the second generation and we think it was sold between 1980 and 1989. We already know who wasn't behind it, but contrary to popular belief, the original 5544 was the work of a team, not just one man, and anecdotally, most of that team stuck around for the development of the successor product. Previously, we talked about Gunnar, who joined the company the year after this picture was taken and gravitated towards these products, becoming the lead at some point. Presumably, he was also involved. So another thing I thought I would do to put uh, it into context here is get out this old Pi Unicam price list. Uh, this is uh, published 1985. Uh, I think this fell out of the manual of something that I bought at some point. I can't even remember what. But it's pretty interesting because it has um, it actually has the 5534 inside it. So let's um, open this up and get to the relevant section. There it is there. Uh, a question that I've received by email uh, a couple of times now is uh, I've got this PM5515 or something on my on my workbench and I'm interested to know how it compares to the, the sort of equipment that I demonstrate on this channel. Well that's a, a really good interesting question and you will notice on this, uh, on this price list here we've got two different sections for uh, TV test equipment, the radio and television service instruments and television test instruments. It's a bit odd. What we're looking at here is products from two different divisions of Philips. So this is a German, a German division that made TV test equipment. And this stuff down here is the Danish TV test equipment division. These sorts of instruments were sold typically around about this sort of price point, sort of just, just below a thousand pounds sterling. And what you got depended on when you purchased it. They started out very simple. And towards the end of the, the 90s, the, these sorts of instruments became very, very advanced. They had a huge, huge amount of functionality. And that was made possible because of advances in integrated circuit technology. But the, the typical sort of market for this was the, the TV servicemen, and uh, sold in huge numbers and uh, made to a competitive price point rather than the highest possible specification, build quality, etc. The, this stuff down here is, uh, just looking at the prices, you can see this is really just a completely different league. And uh, the Danish Philips, they, they targeted different markets, so they would have been mostly interested in companies who were manufacturing TV equipment, whether it be studio, um, transmission, or even TVs themselves. If you, want a, if you want the ultimate reference of something, you would buy, buy one of these items. So if you were making broadcast modulators, um, for maybe a £2,000 price point, you might buy a PM5580 for £6,500 to compare your product against. And uh, it wasn't just that sort of industry as well. They did sell a bit of equipment to the, the television broadcasting industry. So things like PM5534s, the, that's the test pattern generator in question today. That's something they would have sold, sold a bit off to that sort of industry. And looking at the prices here, you know, we can see that uh, it's pretty pretty expensive. Twelve and a half thousand pounds, uh, and this is in 1985. I just had a quick, quick look to see what what this would have bought you. So this would have been about a 60% down payment on the average UK family home uh, at that time. So that really gives you a sense of how sort of out of reach this sort of equipment was for for a TV serviceman, for example. Now this thing was sold to me as PM5534 not working for parts as if I'm going to be scrapping it for parts. Unless half of it is missing, this thing is going to work again. The seller didn't even say which version of it it was. For example, is it PAL? Is it CCAM? Is it NTSC? 
So looking at the identification plate on the back, it is a PM5534G, which uh, this is the just the ordinary PAL version. And I suppose that's good because we are mostly a PAL channel here, but in some ways it's also unfortunate because to find an NTSC or System I version, for example, would be absolutely fabulous because those are just so incredibly rare. But uh, yeah, unfortunately this is just the most ordinary, most common model here. So opening up this thing uh, is actually rather easy. So we've got a couple of holes on the side here which uh, may or may not have screws in them. If they do, you just whip them out. And once, uh, once you've done that, you can just grab these two tabs at the bottom here, rotate them out and slide the inner generator out just like that. Uh, it's just absolutely magnificent. And so if this were bolted into a rack, you wouldn't even have to remove it to service it. And just looking, just looking at what we can see here, there's all these adjustments. So even having only pulled this out about four inches, we've got so much, so much available to us. So yeah, really, I think these, these things must have been just an absolute pleasure to, to service. So we have the uh, inner generator on the bench here, and we can now see all of the insides of it. I noticed, uh, just looking at the pictures of it for sale, uh, the rack mount tabs were missing. And this would indicate to me that uh, it's come from a lab application. It's some kind of bench top unit. Now, uh, when I, whenever I get these things, the biggest source of intrigue is whether or not they will contain the text generation options like the station ID and the clock. And my finding generally is that they never do. And that is because they've come from a lab or TV factory application where these options just wouldn't really be needed and it would just be ludicrous to spend an extra $2,000 buying them. I've heard that uh, the broadcast units, which usually do contain these options, they, they generally always get scrapped because when uh, analog studios and transmitters are decommissioned, they will pay a quote-unquote recycling company to come in and clear out all of the equipment, and that company will just scrap all of it. They don't even attempt to sell it because... Uh, Realistically, who wants a bunch of old analog TV equipment at the switch off of analog TV? Nobody really. This is all just weird, obscure stuff that nobody would ever be looking for. So unfortunately, it just goes straight in the trash. Whereas these, these uh, lab and TV factory units often do survive. And the reason for that is because they are bundled in with other equipment like oscilloscopes and spectrum analyzers that people might actually want to buy. And there are established sales channels for this kind of equipment. And items like this can occasionally sneak into those sales channels and they do manage to survive. Now this one here, when I first opened it, I, I could not believe my eyes because we can see here we have a time clock and a text generator. So this one is effectively in a broadcast configuration, even though it probably isn't a broadcast unit. I don't actually know for sure at the moment. It might be a broadcast unit. We will find out because whatever text was programmed into this card will still be there. The obvious question here is why does there need to be a PM5534 when there was the PM5544 was perfectly fine? Well, if you've ever looked inside a PM5544, you will notice that it uh, it looks rather rather primitive, and there there was a lot of opportunities to refine it. the The implementation of it is very large. It has a whole lot of cards, big cards in it, and it only contains the the generator. Whereas there's, this thing has a bunch of other new options which there wasn't really space for inside of the original. And uh, there's about four or five of them. So starting down this end here, the, this one's the oven controlled crystal oscillator, which I don't have. Um, and I don't really care that I don't have it either. The subcarrier generator, this was a separate piece of equipment in the original. Sync generator, once again, that's a separate piece of equipment in the original. But now it uh, fits, on, fits on just the one card. And also the clock. This is, a, this is a new thing for this generator. Uh, the PM5544, you'll often see recordings on YouTube labeled PM5544 within pattern clocks. Actually, this is going to be coming from newer equipment. The first with an in-pattern clock was this piece of equipment. And it's just a clock as well. There's no date capability. A chrominous modulator, this is a new option. This is the color encoder. So for the PM5544, that had to be a separate piece of equipment. This slot here, now for a long time, it's been a bit of a mystery as to what actually goes in there, but we, in the making of this video, we have learned that uh, in the CCAM version of this piece of equipment, the color encoder is actually split across two different PCBs, so there'll be this one and this one. So that's why, that's why we never see this one populated, because there's only the CCAM version which has it. Now the first thing I want to do is pull out the options of particular interest here, the clock. There it is. So. 
Pretty simple looking device really, just a bunch of uh, logic chips uh, by counters by the looks of it. And we've got uh, some kind of battery here, and, uh, maybe a NICAD or something from the 1980s. I don't think that's going to be very exciting, so uh, as a part of this video I'd like to replace that. Uh, so we'll put that one back in. And pull out the text generator card because this is just, this is just really, a really exciting option to see. So there it is right there, and uh, once again just a whole bunch of primitive logic tips there. And uh, these, these two bipolar problems, you'll notice I've got new labels on them. And that's because prior to filming this video, I took the, I took the originals out and made copies of them. And that's because um, the, these options are just so ridiculously rare. I don't want to have a situation where there's some kind of disaster and these chips are damaged. Because finding that cop another copy of that code, that's just not, not going to happen. So uh, I really want to be very, very cautious there. So we'll put that one back in. Um, and have a look at the circle generator. This is another one I've already had out before filming this. So the, there it is, the circle leap ROM there. I've already uh, made a copy of that. I noticed the type of EEPROM there, it's a 1702A, and when I first saw this I was like, whoa, that is a seriously old EEPROM. And uh, making a copy of this uh, is actually rather difficult. You'll find that uh, no commercial programmer whatsoever, no matter how expensive, will, will be able to program one of these. And even finding a piece of vintage equipment which will program it, uh, that's pretty unlikely as well. I've, uh, I've, I mean, I've, ne I've never seen one come up for sale on eBay. If you want to program one of these, you actually will have to build your own. So we'll pop that uh, back in there. So I think the next thing to do is uh, we're going to take out the uh, text generator and clock because uh, when powering this thing on, if there's any kind of problem, I do not want these to be damaged because they are just so incredibly scarce and uh, we don't actually need them for the initial debugging. The other thing which I did uh, prior to filming this video was uh, check all the power supply voltages and they're okay, so I'm feeling confident enough to at least switch it on. All right, so let's uh, switch it on and uh, see what happens. Ooh, ooh, gosh, my TV is making a nasty sound. It does not not like that so I'm just gonna just gonna switch that off again uh, so not really sure what uh, what to make of that um, I think probably m maybe we get out the oscilloscope and have a look what's have a look what's coming out of it uh, also just noticed that the uh, the power light is not working as well that's probably going to be an incandescent bulb so another another thing which is going to need to be sorted out Okay, so oscilloscope hooked up to the output on the front panel here, and uh, let's just switch it on. Ooh. Well, uh, it kind of looks like the output of a Phyllis pattern generator, but it's not uh, blocking. Ooh, gosh, the uh, timings seem to be changing. Look at that, the, the, the sync is like... Yeah, that's uh, this is interesting. I, I I have no idea what to make of it. So I guess I guess it's kind of working. Um, I think what we might do is uh, maybe hook the counter up to some of these outputs, the the subcarrier and sync output on the front panel, and see what the actual uh, frequencies are there. All right, so we've hooked up the subcarrier output to the uh, counter here, and let's switch it back on. Four. Four, three, three, five, eight. Uh, pretty well, bang on. So I think the the subcarrier oscillator is okay. Let's try the sync output. Oh yeah, that's uh, that's not good. That's uh, far too low. Probably should be more like fifteen point. Uh, I think it's nearly sixteen kilohertz. It's more like fifteen point one there. But. Uh, yeah, it's kind of jumping around all over the place. But interestingly, it's actually steadily increasing. I wonder if we just leave it, uh, whether or not it'll uh, eventually get to the correct number. Huh. I think I might actually just plug it back into the TV and see if it'll eventually, eventually, uh, see if we eventually get a picture out of it. All right, so we're gonna give it another go, plugged into the TV, but we'll be a little bit more patient this time. Now, I just had a quick look uh, online, and the correct number that we should see for the sync output is 15.734 kilohertz. So yeah, that number we were seeing before is definitely way too low. So uh, let's, uh, let's switch it back on. Oh God, that just sounds so nasty, but I 
think the signal output is okay, so it shouldn't blow my TV up. Like there, yeah, that sync output is just steadily increasing there. Now I think there, we should eventually get to a point where the sync. Oh, hey, oh, we got a picture. Uh, looking pretty messy there, but uh, the TV is definitely satisfied there's something coming out of it, and it's looking like a, a Philips pattern. So, I guess, I don't know if it's ever going to stabilize or not, but uh, in theory, as this gets closer, if it gets closer to 15.7, it should start looking better? I don't know, let's just sit here and watch. Well, 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 we have, uh, we have a Philips circle pattern on the screen here. And that counter is showing 16 kilohertz, which I don't think is correct. So it's possible that I don't have the trigger set up correctly. But uh, nonetheless, I'm fairly confident that the, my original diagnosis is correct and that there's something wrong with the, the sync generator. So um, I, I think what I want to do right now is switch it off and plug those text generator modules back in because I'm really excited to see what's going to come out of them. Okay, so we have the uh, text generator modules back in, so let's uh, switch it on. And, whoa, there's some actual text. And hey, look at it as well. Uh, that's, uh, that's really cool. So we've got some text and we've got the clock. Now I've seen countless um, captures and recordings of the PM5544 on the internet. That clock is just so distinctive, the six digits without the colons between the two. But to actually see it come to life in front of me right here, this is just absolutely fantastic. It's really, really exciting. And the text here is interesting, so I, I speculated whether or not this would be a broadcast or TV factory unit. Well, off the top of my head, I would guess this is the initials of some TV factory, and this, this probably is going to be the location of it, I would guess. Um, but uh, yeah, really interesting that they, uh, they forked out for uh, those options, and uh, just absolutely, absolutely brilliant to see them working right here in front of me. But uh, as, we've, as we've seen, there's something wrong with this unit. That sync generator, it's, it's quite of interesting. And uh, it was interesting how quickly it came to life the second time around. So the fault is uh, possibly thermal in nature, or possibly it's that something is some kind of phase locked loop or something is charging up very slowly. And it, it came to life quicker the next time around because it still had a bit of charge in it from when we ran it previously. So I guess we gotta, we got to have a look at that sync module and try and work out what's wrong with it. Now I do actually have uh, another piece of equipment which I think can probably help us out here. The magnificent PM5570. So what business do we have with it? Well, look what we have down the back here. It is that same sync generator. Yoink! So what I'm going to do is go and take out the sync module that it came with and put in the one from the PM5570. So let's uh, switch it on. <laughs> well, look at that. It just worked first go. Well, this is good because uh, we now know exactly where the fault is, but I'm not about to go sacrificing one masterpiece in order to save another. So we need to figure out what is wrong with the sync module that it came with. Well, here's our two sync modules, and both looking pretty similar here. And I think this should be pretty straightforward to figure out what's going on here, uh, not least because there's been a rather extraordinary development. The actual manual for the PM5544 has been located. Uh, it came from Stan, who many will be familiar with. Uh, he, he was the one who restored the only surviving Tescard G generator. Now, for those unawares, Tescar G is a modified Philips pattern that was concocted by the BBC, and uh, it, it was it's realized by modifying physical PM5544s. The, the BBC basically went in there and made a whole bunch of electrical changes to it, which changed the appearance of the test card. It's, uh, it's pretty interesting because the Philips pattern was not, not, not very successful in the UK. 
In terms of the actual repair here, um, I've actually just received an email from Stan and he's saying that, uh, gee, I hope your um, highly obscure OQ5506 and 5502 chips are okay because they're looking pretty hard to find. So I'm now like super anxious about these things. And I noticed that they're actually both socketed. Um, I think probably one of the first things I'm going to do is, is uh, try and swap them over. Um, this is a pretty, pretty crude form of debugging, but I'm just so worried about these chips being faulty that uh, I'm actually going to start with this. So let's, um, let's whip out the 5506 here. Now, normally I would use a little a pair of extractor, an extractor like that, but uh, that capacitor is kind of blocking me. So we'll just go into the screwdriver and prise this one out. Be very careful because, yeah, I don't want to damage this. I'll pull that one out. Put that there and preserve the orientation because I don't want to put it in backwards. Uh, that one out. Pop that one in there. And pop that one in there. Just for now. So, all right. So I've waited a couple more hours for everything to cool down again, and let's just switch it on. Oh, oh look at that! I can't believe that. So the first thing I try and that fixes it. And of course, it's the most annoying and most disappointing fault possible. Ugh. So what are we going to do about this faulty OQ5506? Well, first, let's talk a little bit about what it is. Now, a chip that uh, has an OQ prefix on it is a Philips chip. But you will only ever find them inside of a Philips product, and typically you won't you won't find a datasheet for it. It's some kind of um, internal part. One thing I did come across is uh, in the manual for the PM5519, uh, which is one of these cheapy uh, German generators. When I say cheapy, it's certainly still pretty expensive, but a heck of a lot cheaper than this thing. Uh, now, normally these German generators have absolutely nothing in common with the Danish generators at all, but uh, the PM5519 has both of these chips inside it. And there's a note in the manual, uh, which is uh, online, that the 5506 is a replacement of the 5501, which is obtainable. Um, so I'm going to buy a 5501 uh, and, and put it in there and see if that works. There is also some 5506s for sale on AliExpress. I've, uh, I've actually tried to buy some OQ type chips off that seller before. They never, never shipped anything. I got my money back, but I'll, I'll give them another try just on the, on the off chance that uh, something might actually show up. So while I was impatiently waiting for my replacement OQ5501 to arrive in the post, I was doing a little bit of experimentation. So what I did was attach my oscilloscope probe on the input of the OQ5506, the chip which I'm suspecting might be faulty. And what I found is that the units instantly burst into life as soon as I did that, which is pretty interesting. Uh, touching the probe of an oscilloscope on something adds a little bit of capacitance. So that would indicate to me that the chip is not outright faulty, it's just a little bit touchy. So what I've done here is I've just put a 10 picofarad capacitor across its input, so between the input and ground, which might approximately simulate the touching of the oscilloscope probe on it. So if I switch it on now, well, from cold it just works straight away. So what the heck is going on here? Well, another observation I made is that if I move this supposedly faulty chip into the PM5570's sync board, this one exhibits the fault which I'm seeing with this. So I'm pretty pretty comfortable to say that uh, the fault is definitely with the chip and not some other components on the board. So what to do about it then? Well, I've, I've deployed a little workaround. So if we look on the back here, uh, I've just put this little 18 picofarad capacitor across the clock input and ground. And what this is going to do is snub out any ringing which may be occurring on the clock input of this chip. As for why we're seeing any ringing on there, not really sure. I'm not even able to measure it because, as I said, when I put the oscilloscope on that input, it fixes the problem, so it must be very, very faint. And I had a check on the oscilloscope to see what this looks like. It looks pretty clean, so I think this is a reasonable workaround for the time being. 
So now it's time to try and sort out that battery. The one that it came with is the same type as that new green one there, but it's wrapped in that grey plastic tube with some caps with lugs stuck to the end of it. So the plan was to try and rip those lugs off and spot weld them to the new battery. But uh, yeah, I had uh, quite a bit of trouble getting them off. Got them off eventually. Um, then once those were removed, I had to take the solder tabs off the new battery um, because I, I couldn't find any with that sort of termination on it. And once I got those off, I then took it downstairs and attempted to spot weld the tabs onto the new battery, but my little battery welder there just rejected them because they're far too big. So plan B was to just spot weld some thin nickel strips to the new battery and then solder the lugs to the new battery, which is not ideal, but uh, yeah. So then I had to put some heat shrink on because it's um, quite a bit thinner than the old battery. So after that, just a case of screwing it back on and uh, then job done. Time for the all important rebrand. So what we're gonna be doing is changing the text in the top and bottom boxes. In the top box, we're gonna go from three to six characters and in the bottom box, we're going to go from five to seven characters. So this one will be quite simple. I'll just be adding one character either side of what's there and changing the five in the middle. But for the top box, it's a bit more complicated because we're going from an odd number of characters to an even number of characters. And when you do that, it creates problems with the horizontal alignment. So what we have to do is center the adjustment in here, which is this little pot down here. It's presently at an extreme end of the adjustment, so we'll bring it round to the center of the adjustment, which is that point there. So when I do that, I can see that the text appears over to the right. So one of the things I had to decide is where I'm gonna add two characters. So I'm gonna add two characters to that side and one character to that side, and that gets me from an odd to an even number. And that should allow me to center the text once I've changed it. How might we go about changing the text in this card? Well, the particular focal point on here is these two bipolar proms. These are character proms, so they contain the entire character set for the 5534. And if we look here, we've got a little small prom, and this is gonna be the one that decides what actually appears on screen. So what we're gonna do is take this out and dump the code out of it and modify it. And uh, in theory, just by changing that one, we should be able to change what it says. Here is the contents of that little prom, just 32 bytes in size. The first 16 set the top text and the second 16 set the bottom text. The hex code 20 is a space or blank character. We can see the actual three characters in the top box there and the five in the bottom box. This is the hex codes for the character set, so pretty straightforward to make the change. Once that's done, I have to buy a new bipolar prom and write it because the old one cannot be changed. And at the present time, it's about 10 euros a go to change the text. So here we are with the new text and uh, already looking pretty good, but the horizontal alignment of that top text, a little bit off. A lot of broadcasters didn't really bother with this and you see all sorts of crazy positioning, but uh, we do like to do things properly around here. So let's just give that a little bit of a tweak. So I'm just going by the two T's which are in the center and we'll just line those up with the grid lines. There we go, very nice. I thought it might be quite interesting to have a look at the controls inside the front panel here and see what they do. Let's start off with the clock. So to set the clock, we push that to set, which stops it. From there, we can then set the minutes and hours. So to set the minutes, we click that one to start and the minutes start incrementing one per second. So we'd get to the appropriate minute that we want and stop it, and then we would do the same with ours. Press start, count it up to where we want it. And then presumably you would set it one minute ahead of what you were trying to achieve and then wait for the real time to roll around to that. And when you get to it, you press the run button and then the seconds start counting up like that. So quite a nice experience, I think. And uh, in the newer generators, there are various means of precisely setting the time but uh, in this one, the, the time is only as accurate as the finger of he who is setting it. 
So next up, let's have a look at these four switches here. This one which says, in sync, if I depress it, that no EXT LED turns on. And this is saying that there's no external sync input. But if I connected one, that would turn off, and the unit would gen lock to that input. This one here, which says color diff norm. Uh, if I press that, the color sidebars or color different signals switch off. Many may recognize this sort of Philips pattern. There were a couple of well-known transmissions of it, one from TDF France and another from WNYW, uh, the only uh, North American transmission of the Philips pattern that I'm aware of. In both cases, they have their sidebars switched off. The sidebars are these colors here. My understanding is these only are significant in PAL. So those two transmissions I just talked about are CCAM and NTSC. So I guess it's fair to turn them off. I don't necessarily agree with the practice myself. The, if these are switched off and this test card is being used as a reference for color conversions from CCAM or NTSC to PAL, well then that's, that rather useful reference has just been eliminated from the pattern. And there certainly are plenty of examples of CCAM and NTSC patterns where they are present. Next up we have the, the alternating different signals and if you look down the sides here you should be able to see these, this flickering here. This is the uh, sometimes known as the anti-PAL. It's a, that uh, deliberate phase error in the Philips pattern that I've talked about before. So you can switch that off so you can see that flickering disappears. And the last one is grid only. So if I press that one then we lose the central portion of the pattern. And we can even turn off the sidebars as well and just have a grid. So really waste our money. But uh, yeah, anyway, that's what all of the controls do. Quite fun to play with. And I'm quite surprised that nobody's really ever done a demo of that before, given how many of these generators are in enthusiast hands. Now we're going to talk about the Loch Ness Monster of test pattern generators. Some claim to have seen it. Low quality photographs exist. We are, of course, talking about the PM5538. I've seen a number of mentions of this thing on the web and uh, the odd recording on YouTube. And when I first came across it, I was quite intrigued. So I went and grabbed my full form catalog here and found that uh, PM5538, oh, it's a teletext generator. Ha. Huh. Well, uh, it's all uh, nicely explained here and uh, I'm not really seeing any mentions of this square looking Phillips pattern whatsoever. So, hmm, I'm feeling a little bit suspicious here. So what are we looking at here then? Well, I've looked through the catalogues of the 70s and 80s from cover to cover and I can't find any mention whatsoever of some kind of mythical square Phillips pattern generator. What I think we're looking at here is the PM5544. And the, the thing that would indicate that it is, is the, the text in here appears to be that of the PM5543 text generator, which is demonstrated quite clearly in here. The font is a little bit different to our 5534. I don't have this hardware on me, so I, I can't do a demonstration of it. In terms of the actual test card, although I'm suspicious about the name of it, the recordings of it are quite interesting. What I think we're looking at here is a couple of faulty PM5544s. Both of these recordings were made in the Middle East, and if they are transmitter-based recordings, then they are possibly running in a very, very hot environment and have developed some kind of fault. And the JTV one is interesting because it looks like there is more than one fault. I think both of them have a failure in the circle generator, but the JTV one also appears to have a failure in the vertical divider. That's the circuitry which decides what happens when, when the frame is progressing vertically. And I think we might be able to recreate the fault of the circle generator at the very least. It should just be a matter of removing the circle EEPROM, like this and inserting a blank. And the reason we're doing this is because these are PMOS EEPROMs. When they're blank, they read out all zeros, which would instruct the generator to start the frame at the beginning of the central area every time, which I think will recreate so-called PM5538 quite easily. Well, there we have it. That was easy. Now straight away we can see that quote-unquote PM5538 has a slight problem where the central portion of the pattern overlaps with the sidebars. 
And internally, these two signals are being summed together and creating a very high voltage, which would be above the white level. And it's quite visible in, uh, in, in my display of it here. But when you look at the actual recordings of it, you don't really see this quite so prominently. You can see it, just not as exaggerated as this. And the reason for this is something which I talked about back in video number one, in that broadcast modulators typically have a clipper circuit in them, which will limit the, the maximum input voltage, which would uh, quite nicely fix this problem and actually make quite a nice test card. But uh, yeah, anyway, I think... Uh, I think that's a, a reasonable reconstruction of this mysterious test card. And uh, what we could do to improve it is we could actually modify the circle EEPROM to cut off the, the central portions of the pattern around here so that they don't overlap with the sidebars. But I don't really think that's worth bothering with because we would be recreating something that never existed. If we're going to have a play around with the circle EEPROM, I can think of something more interesting that we can do with it. Two things I'm going to say about this. Number one, I'm going to pretend that you didn't see this. Number two, if others are allowed to make shit up, then so am I. Let's pop it in there and give it a try. There it is. Well, I'm not sure if it's particularly technically useful, but I tried to make it at least geometrically interesting. These lines here should be exactly 45 degrees, and they also exactly intersect with the grid. And it really shows what you can do with the circle EEPROM, in that you can use it to instruct the generator to basically make any kind of shape that you want in the center section here. So we're going to wrap up this video with a quick teardown of this unit, and in a minute we will also have a quick look at that PM3570 as well for comparison. So I'm just going to take out the modules which we haven't already looked at, starting off with the subcarrier generator here. So this is the oscillator for the color subcarrier. Looks quite complicated, and that's because it also has to be able to lock onto an external input if one is present. So I'll pop that one back in. Sync generator, we've already seen that a few times. That's generating the sync portion of the sync signal. Uh, up here, rectifier unit. This is not going to be very interesting. Just a bunch of capacitors and some bridge rectifiers there. Some people might say, well, why am I not recapping this? Well, I have quite a lot of vintage equipment, and realistically, I don't have time to go recapping all of it. I wouldn't bother unless I specifically thought there was a problem with it. Voltage regulator. Not much going on there, just some op amps and trimmers and transistors by the looks of it. The actual voltage regulation will be done by those big transistors on the back. Sync interface. This one, uh, I believe, is various amplification and buffering for the sync signals. And uh, the black and burst signal is generated inside of here. Well, not generated, but uh, the combination of these two come together into here and go to the rear panel from this card. Text generator, we've already looked at that. Horizontal divider. Some logic chips in here. So this is going to be creating control signals uh, which decide what's, what happens as the, the scan line progresses horizontally. Uh, I think there's also a voltage controlled oscillator in there which uh, drives the circle generator which we'll have a look at in a minute. Vertical divider. A whole bunch more logic chips. So this is just going to be creating control signals which determine various things that happen as the frame progresses vertically. This big one here, these ones are quite a bit harder to get out. Black and white generator plus control it says. Whole lot of logic chips on there. This one generates all of the monochrome 
portions of the pattern. So the grids, the border castellations, and various other monochrome bits and pieces which are, appear throughout it. And we've got a whole bunch of adjustments on there, so that will be setting all the levels. The, these strips here, this is just uh, grounding because it's a double-sided PCB and they've jammed a hell of a lot on there, so there's no room left for, for any actual grounding. Color difference generator, another big one which I'm going to be struggling to get out. So this one generates all of the color in the pattern except for the color bars. So the color sidebars, the anti-pal, and the yellow, red, yellow, I believe. Bunch of adjustments on there, of course. Circle generator, we already looked at. But that is used for cropping the central area of the pattern to a circle. Grayscale generator. This generates the grayscale which appears in the central circle. You might be wondering why there's 10 trimmers on here. Well that's because there is a 10 step mode so you can adjust each and every level individually. Oh dear, a little bit just fell off there. Um, anyway, let's pop that back in. Multiburst generator. Quite a lot going on there. The, this one's generating the multiburst, which appears in the central circle of the pattern. A uh, bunch of adjustments there. I'm not sure what they all do, but some of them are adjusting the various frequencies uh, which appear in the multiburst. One interesting point about this card is that it is one of the heaviest modified in the original realizing of test cards G. So in that, the BBC added a bunch of extra components. This one is actually able to generate a test card G without any modifications to the PCB, but uh, it's not able to do it in its present state. So notice here that there is a missing trimmer on here. This one sets the frequency for the sixth frequency grating. So you could actually populate these components and equip this for test card G. And I think it might be an interesting thing to do. I'm not sure whether or not that would be a, the right thing to do, given that this is a vintage piece of equipment modifying it, but it would be interesting. Uh, there's another trimmer there that's also unpopulated. No mention of what that's for in the manual, but it almost looks like it might be for a seventh grating. So we'll pop that one back in. Color bar generator up next. Some of these are really stiff. So that generates the EBU color bars. Loads of adjustments on there. I haven't uh, looked what they all do. But uh, at least some of them will be setting the levels of the colors which come out of this. Make sure we put that back in the right slot, because remember, slot 17. Don't want to put anything in there. Chrominance modulator. So that's a color encoder. Not really a lot to say about that, but I'm sure the design of it is absolutely beautiful. Next up, the output amplifier. So this board here brings together all of the various signals inside of the unit and combines them into the outputs, of which there are three, I believe, all individually buffered. I heard that uh, quite a lot of work went into this, and that doesn't really surprise me. This, this piece of equipment had, was really world class in terms of the quality of its output, so they would have spent a lot of time getting that one right. So we'll put that one back in. And last up was the clock, which we're not going to look at again, but one of the things I forgot to mention about it is you'll notice that it has no character generator on it. And that is because what it does is sends control signals to the text generator, instructing it to put characters on the screen at the appropriate point in time. So I've just flipped the unit over here and we're having a look at the backplane, which to me is one of the most interesting parts about it. The whole thing, as you can see, is completely point to point. It's just absolutely extraordinary how much work would have gone into this, and it really just tells you the sort of league that the Danish Philips was in. The fact that it was actually economical to construct something like this. 
And to me, it's just such a shame when these things get scrapped because all that effort that went into putting that together is just lost. And I think probably quite a few people would like to have one of these, just even just as an ornament. And just for comparison, I've got the PM5570 out here. This is another really beautiful 1980s piece. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about it today because it's off topic for this video. And actually, I just found another video on YouTube about it. So I'll link to that in the description. But just look at the, the just look at the construction of this thing. All of these modules in here, all these adjustments. It's just absolutely crazy. Now, interestingly, this thing was actually sold for less than the PM5534. It doesn't look to me like it would have cost less to make. So if we look at the underside here, just another completely ridiculous manual construction, point to point, backplane there, all of these wires all nicely wrapped and tied. Just think of the number of hours it would have taken to put this thing together, my gosh. And a whole lot more graft at the front here with the termination of the wiring loom to those switches. Anyway, that's about it for the PM5570. I just, as I said, I just don't have time to cover this thing today, but I'll try and cover it better in future. Well, I hope you found that interesting, and for me, I've really enjoyed looking at these beautiful pieces from the 1980s. They're just so interesting to look at. I apologise for the length of this video. I tried my best to keep it under that magic 30 minutes, which everybody says you shouldn't exceed, but there were just so many things I wanted to include in this that unfortunately I just ended up going over it. And I didn't want to split the video in two because nobody would have watched the second half of it. Anyway, that is all for this video, so thanks for watching.